Now, you guys probably got something like this when you went into practice, right? So you got maybe a little a, a bag with a kit. They're kind of like a kit to help you do your job. So here's a stethoscope here and um, tuning fork, depending on your specialty, whatever you might use. And then there's this really scary looking pinwheel thing, which I used to always think like that was very scary when they take that out. And as a little girl, I used to go to the doctor and they'd do that on me all the time. And then a reflex checker and this nice crisp white coat, a lab coat. Some of you need that. And then you got this great book. Everything that you need to know about marketing and managing your successful practice, right? You guys got no. this book? No. no. No, nobody got this book? <laughs> no, because they don't have that book. They don't train you how to do marketing. They don't tra train you how to manage a practice. Then you go into practice and you find that if you're in integrative medicine especially, that that's something that you need to do or if, you know, in any kind of natural medicine in private practice on your own. You've got to market, you've got to manage, you've got to be an HR director, you, you know, there's all kinds of things that you have to deal with. So today I'm going to talk to you, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can put these things into your practice, how you can sort of streamline your practice, how you can manage your practice, how you can train staff, hire the right people, in order to really help you to have a very successful practice. Um, now, you know, I, I um, tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm here. So I ran a medical practice in Los Angeles for, actually it was chiropractic practice, for 18 years. Um, and you know, I, I never really expected to be doing that. I was on a very different trajectory. I was, um, you know, I, I had kind of an interesting life. I used to work in the aerospace industry, and in the aerospace industry, I learned a lot about creating systems. So really, if there's one industry that works on systems, it's the aerospace industry. You gotta be pretty precise. So I learned a lot about creating efficiency and creating systems. And then, actually, believe it or not, I was a congressional intern. I worked for my local congressman in Washington, and then, and then I actually, or my local congressman here in LA. And then I went to Washington, D.C. and worked in D.C. And um, in, that, in that job, I learned a lot about how to create community, really how to get a lot of community loyalty, and how to build a big base around, around um, the community. So I'm going to talk a lot about that today, too, because the thing that I, I found helped us to create a very successful practice was creating community and then having efficient systems. Um, so you know, like I said, I didn't really ever intend that I would be talking to you guys about managing a medical practice. I never, ever thought that I would be up here like talking about practice management. I thought I was going to be you know, working in the entertainment industry, which is what I was doing when something happened that changed my life forever. And I had three car accidents in three months. And it was pretty devastating at that time. Um, I wasn't able to get better. I went through about eight months of treatment, of traditional medical treatment. Um, and I was actually, after eight months of care and about $30,000, I was a lot worse than I was when I started off. So I was addicted to a lot of pills. I wasn't able to sleep. I was taking one pill for this, one pill for that. And I didn't really see any way out. I had been to the best doctors in LA, you know, what they said were the best doctors, and nobody could really help me. So finally they said, you know what, they referred me to a shrink. They said, well, you know, we can't help you. We don't know what to do with you. So they sent me to a, you know, psychologist. and. Um, I kind of resigned that my life was going to be different, that that was it. I was not going to be, play, be playing golf anymore or tennis. I used to be really active. And I just thought, that, that's it. I'm, the life, my life as I knew it is over. Um, so luckily, I met the doctor that would save my life. So he happened to be a chiropractor. And he took a very different approach than any of these other doctors that I had been seeing. He looked at the whole person. He said, you know, we want to get to the root cause of what's going on with you. There are certain things. Because also, you know, I was born with a, a congenital hip problem. So I actually wore braces on my legs until I was about six years old. So I had a lot of underlying things. Nobody ever even asked me that. And funnily enough, I didn't even remember that until I started getting adjusted. After I started getting adjusted, all these memories started coming up about that. So very interesting. So there's a lot to the mind-body healing that I started to learn. And I became very aware that there's a lot more to healing than just technical skill of the doctor. It's, it's a complete experience. So I started to get better under that doctor's care. 
and so much so that I wanted to work in his office. So I've, I healed from a lot of things that I had had no problems with my whole life. And I actually felt healthier after I had those accidents than you know, I, I ever had actually when I was even 16 years old. So um, I started working in that office and I made it a point to really treat people the way that I wanted to be treated because part of the reason I think I was not able to get better was just, it was so impersonal. All of the care that I got was very impersonal. You'd walk into an office and the staff could care less. It just was not an atmosphere for healing. It was just not a place where I could feel comfortable to heal, really. And, and I wasn't even aware of it, but now looking back, that that's probably was a big part of it as well, that there just was not that human touch. There was not that caring, caring touch there. So I, um, so this is a picture of our office. And Karina, I see her like nodding because she yeah. was there. She was actually a patient. It's so funny for me. This is coming full circle, yeah. because I, you know, I, I started working there because I didn't want anyone else to ever suffer the way that I suffered, to be in the same kind of pain that I had been in, and that's why I really made it a point to create an atmosphere that was conducive to healing, to really treat the patients the way that I had wanted to be treated. The, all the, all those, you know, all those months that I was trying to get better and couldn't. Um, so, you know, I, I ended up just doing a lot of things naturally. We ended up seeing, um, you know, when I started, when I first met that doctor who's seeing about 11 patients a day, and uh, after about two and a half years of just doing relational marketing, just, you know, no big advertising, nothing like that, all word of mouth, we were seeing 200 patients a day, and that was with the staff of four. We loved what we were doing, and it was really, you know, it's all about educating patients and teaching them what was coming next. So what I'm gonna talk about is a lot of what I did. Now, now you know, I've, I've been involved in internet marketing now for, you know, help for healthcare. I've been working with a woman named JJ Virgin, um, doing something called the Mindshare Summit, which Hyla's been to, I think a few other people, Trisha has been to Mindshare. Um, but I've been working with a lot of health experts that are you know, PBS celebrities, they have big online um, followings, and you know, really it's about getting the message out there. And that's really what I'm all about now, is really helping to get that message out there. You know, when I was working in the chiropractic office, we could impact 200 patients a day, but now that I'm consulting with other doctors, I can help them impact 200 patients a day, and I'll talk to someone else, and I can help them impact 200 patients a day. So really, I'm really living my mission, and my mission is to make sure that more people know about integrative medicine, and that they're able to, able to get that, that kind of care. So I really appreciate you all being here today because you're really part of the solution and there's so much need out there for people to get to the root cause of what's going on. So, so tonight I'm going to talk about the five strategies um, that I used and that are very effective in helping uh, you know, to create an efficient practice and also create a profitable practice. Uh, so the st first strategy, retain more clients and then identify and attract your ideal client, connect with the clients. Um, create packages and programs in your office, and then automate your marketing. So let's take a look at clients. So it costs 10 times as much to um, get a new client as it does to retain an old client. So you guys know marketing is expensive, right? I think it used to cost, one time I figured it out, it cost us about $300 to get a new patient. That's how much it costs. So it, you know, it'd take a couple visits before you'd make a profit on someone. So it's really good if you can keep more of the new patients that you get, you're gonna be ahead of the game. And so, the, and the way that you're gonna do that is to really be client-centric, is to focus on the clients, focus on how you can make your office stand out, how you can create an extraordinary experience for those clients that are coming in to your office. From the very first phone call, um, really how can you set yourself apart? How can you make that very first touch, that very first contact with your office? Because they're really coming into your office. As soon as they call, the receptionist picks up the phone, that patient is making an impression of your office right there on the phone. It's like they're coming into your office. So, you know, a lot of doctors have their new person answer the phone. Like just, oh yeah, yeah, just start answering the phone. When, and that's just a mistake. Because you know? if that's a new client, that can be hundreds and maybe hundreds and thousands of dollars that you're going to miss out on because the person's not handling that call well. So um, now here's my favorite quote from Maya Angelou is, uh, the people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget the way that you made them feel. And so it's really about thinking about the experience that you want the client to have when they leave your office. How do you want them to feel? And how can you create that experience for them 
to have them feel the way that you want them to feel when they leave your office. You know, good and bad. I left some offices feeling pretty bad <laughs> when, when I was out there trying to get help. Um, now, so do you really know what the patient is experiencing in your, in your office? Because really, when you think about it, your clients are spending about 30% of their time with you and about 70% of the time interacting with your office, whether that's on the phone, whether it's sitting in your waiting room, whether it's paying their bill, whether it's dealing with the insurance. So it's really not just the time that you're with them. It's a lot of, a lot of their interaction is something that's not really in your control unless, of course, you take the time to really train your, train your staff and create scripts and create standard operating procedures so that you really know exactly what your staff is doing when you're not there and you, you know, when you're not listening and when, when you're not there to see. So, you know, and it's also about the, um, about the atmosphere, it's about the music that you're playing and it's about, you know, how long are they waiting, what's their first impression of your office. Um, okay, I might just do this. There we go. <laughs> so, so this is just about, you know, great customer service experience creates value. Um, you know, and a lot of times, I mean, people used to say, well, people can't afford to pay cash. People can't afford integrated medicine. They can't really afford to not use their insurance. Um, but it's, I don't think it's really that they can afford it, that they can't afford it. It's about the value that's been created for the services. Because I, in my practice, you know, people would say, oh, I can't afford it. I really can't afford to, you know, pay for your care. And then they'd drive up in a brand new car for their next visit. Or they'd have a facelift, you know, they, or they'd have a boob job. And it's like, uh, like, I thought you couldn't afford this. And so it's about creating the value. So people can afford it because people buy what they want. They don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. So if you, if you really frame your care in something that, that they want, that they get the benefits of it, not just, you know, oh, it's for your health, yeah, but it's for your vitality, it's for your longevity, it's for, you know, t frame, frame how you describe your services in a very benefits-based way, like what are they going to get out of it, what are the benefits? Um, so, now I call it the front stage and the back stage in terms of preparing your office and, and making a great impression. So the front stage is everything that the patient sees. And when you go into your office tomorrow, I invite you, and, you're, and if you have a brick and mortar office, I invite you to walk into your office the way that your patients do. And really kind of look at it with fresh eyes and see what your patients see. Because a lot of times doctors walk in a back entrance and they have no idea what their patients are seeing. They don't know. So just notice and see what you see. See what the patient's first impression is. And sometimes, you know, it might surprise you because you get used to things, right? My mom calls it house blind because you don't see, you know, you might have something sitting by your front door and it's been there for six months and you've just like, you know, you were going to take it to the dry cleaners or whatever and you forgot <laughs> about it. So, and, and you just don't see it anymore. So, so it's the front stage and the back stage. The front stage is everything that the patient sees everything they experience and then there's the backstage which is all the preparation that goes into um, what you do so think of your office visit as a well choreographed um, kind of presentation so and again look at what you want your patient to experience when they leave so it's really about all of those things that go into a great production right so it's the it's the scripts it's rehearsal it's, you know, having regular staff meetings can really help you to train your staff. You know, a lot of doctors that I work with, they, they don't like doing staff meetings. They're like, well I, well, I really don't like having staff. I feel like they're a waste of time and they kind of turn into a gripe fest. And, you know, <laughs> but, but it's really important for you to get your staff together so that, that they can bond with each other and that, that really everyone is on the same page and you've got those standard operating procedures so that everybody is super prepared. When the patient comes in, Everyone in the office is all on the same page. They know what to do. If it's the third visit, this is what you're doing. If it's the fourth visit, this is what you're doing. If they're in for a thyroid problem, this is what they get. This is, you know, this is the prescribed um, course. So that everybody's really kind of on the same page. Then also stay connected with your clients. Um, a great thing that you can do is to survey. So there are a lot of online tools that you can use. SurveyMonkey is one that I really like to uh, that I like to use. It's free and it's a great way to send out a survey to your patients. You can ask them questions. It can be anonymous or they can leave their name, their email address. You can give them a gift. It's a great way to stay in touch with your patients today and tomorrow because there's always changing needs in healthcare. So if you're continually staying in touch with your patients, finding out what is it that they want next, 
then you're going to be the person that they want to go to because you're right there with the, the you know, kind of like the next, the next greatest thing. Um, now, I think you measure up. So, um, you know, a lot of, like, like maybe you say, well, you know, I really don't. I think I've, I've got a great handle on this and on my customer service experience. Well, the statistics actually say that 80% of companies believe that they deliver superior customer experience, but only 8% of their clients say that they do. So sometimes there's a little disparity between that. So, um, and for every customer who bothers to complain, there are 26 customers that don't complain at all. So, um, you know, it's great to just kind of stay in touch and, and ask questions, do a survey. So over deliver to your patients, be extraordinary. Think of what can you do that nobody else out there is doing. You know, a lot of people don't like write personal thank you notes anymore. I am shocked when I get one. You know, when I get a little thank you note that's handwritten in the mail, I'm like overjoyed. I'm like, wow, that is so nice. Someone wrote me a personal thank you card. So that's something that you can do, you know, that, that nobody else is really doing these days. Everyone's sending emails and email cards and that kind of thing. So think of how can you make yourself extraordinary? How can you make yourself stand out from the crowd? Um, so, strategy number two, all right, we're not going to go this long. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on the customer experience because I think that's really, really super important. But strategy number two is targeting your ideal client. So who is your ideal client? Um, how many people have really done any work on figuring out, like, who is your ideal client? Who is that person that you really want to attract? Um, by show of hands, yeah? Okay, all right, awesome. So you guys are, you guys are pretty pretty savvy when it comes to that but so who's your ideal client um, why do you want to do it because it really allows you to streamline your marketing it really allows you to focus in on the people that you want to attract plus those are like your best patients right if you have a if you have a whole office full of your ideal clients like those are the people that follow your instructions they do what you say they refer other people they're the ones that are you know really out there you know singing your praises and so when you have a whole, you know, a day full of those customers, the day sails by, right? It's really easy. You don't have any drama. You don't have those people that are sitting around complaining in your waiting room. It's like you just really like to see more of those ideal clients. And one of the ways to do that is to create your avatar, so your, the representation of your ideal client. Um, again, really, really specific about who they are. How, how many people have really got their avatar down? Like, you know, they're, you know, they're, like middle-aged, say it's a middle-aged woman, she plays tennis, she plays golf. So the more specific that you can be about who your ideal client is, who you really want to target, the more you're going to be able to focus your marketing and the more you're going to be able to find them. Um, I have one client um, that, you know, they, they, have a, they have a very specific product and they found that they advertised on this gardening website that was where their ideal client was. They were all over. Like they sold so many of these things. They put one little ad in this gardening website of all things, and that's the, like it was crazy. Like they just they tripled their sales with that one ad. So you know it's really funny, and it, it just it made sense because their product would really help them. But so it's just about the about really doing the research and really figuring out who is going to get the most benefit out of what you do and who's looking for you. Because when you're really targeting your ideal client, those people that can get the most out of your services, they're probably looking for you as well. And you know, they're the people that say, oh my gosh, I, after your, their first visit, like I've been looking for a doctor like you my whole life. Thank God I found you. you know? And you guys have probably all heard that. And those are the people that you really want to attract. So um, you know, just really get specific. Give them a name. Maybe it's functional medicine. Fran. You know, she's really interested in wellness. She wants IVs. She wants to heal her hormones. Like, like, what is it that they're interested in? And so, when you know who they are, when you know who your ideal client is, it makes it much easier to find them. You can find them. You know, you know where to find them online. You know what they're likely, like what kind of websites they're likely to be on. Maybe what kind of forums. You know where they're. Um, where they're likely to be hanging out, you know, maybe they're, you know, maybe they shop at Whole Foods, maybe they shop at the co-op. So you really know where you might want to schedule a lecture, where you might want to go to find them, where you might want to put, you know, your, your information or materials or take out some kind of advertising. Um, 
Now, one, another way, so once you find them, oops, I didn't talk about this slide. So how do you attract them? So now that you, find, now that you found them, now that you know who they are and you know where they hang out, you know where it's likely that you're going to find them, now you need to make yourself stand out to them. You gotta find the words and the phrases that are gonna make them say, oh my gosh, that doctor really understands me. They really know what I'm struggling with. They really know my problems and my pain points. Um, now you actually have that in your office, believe it or not. You guys have gold in your office. Um, more than any other specialty, you know, like in advertising, people will pay hundreds and thousands of dollars to do focus groups, right? To sit down and have their ideal client talk to them and say what they need, what they want. But you guys get the opportunity to sit knee to knee with them. You can ask them any questions that you want in your intake forms. You ask them, you know, what is, what is this pain preventing you from doing? What is it that you're struggling with? So, you know, think of your ideal client. Think of the people that get the most benefit out of what you do. Think of those people that you absolutely love to see. Go back to your intake forms. And if you're asking the right questions or if you have asked the right questions, you're going to really get some gold there. You're going to find out what was it that they came to see you for? What were they struggling with? What were they hoping to get out of the treatment with you? And those words and phrases will attract your future ideal client like nobody's business because they will see that and they'll say, oh, it, it will get their attention. They'll be like, yeah, I felt like that. Oh my gosh, that's exactly what I thought. Like, have you ever thought? Have you ever felt? Do you want? So those kinds of things. Um, and so here are the right questions to ask. So if you don't have questions like these that are really feeling based, that really have the client or the patient Talk about how they're feeling, looking at how this is affecting their life. Um, so how does the problem affect your life? What are their pain points? What does it prevent you from doing? What is it that you would be doing if you didn't have this condition? What's the ideal outcome of our work together? Future pacing, like what is it that they want? Like what are their dreams? What are their desires? How can you get them to like think beyond their pain or think beyond this problem that they're having? Like what would they be doing? What are their dreams and goals? And then how would your life be different if you didn't have this problem? So, you know, those are, and those are great for the patient too, because it helps them to get out of where they're at and they can say, you know what, this is, I, I need to get rid of this problem. This is really causing me a lot of trouble in my life. Um, so we've talked about the retaining clients, identifying and targeting your ideal client. And the next one is to connect with your clients, connect with, with uh, the patients. So one way to do that is to really tell your story so that they really understand like why are you doing what you're doing. Um, I think it's so important for people to really connect with you when they realize why you went into medicine in the first place or why you're doing what you're doing. Um, not just because you heard you could make a lot of money, you know, when you were in high school, but because you really have, you know, you really have a need and a desire and you're really very motivated to do what you're doing because of something, some experience that you had. Um, you know, like when I told you my story, that I'm really, you know, passionate about what I do because I had this personal experience and my life changed forever because of my experience with, with um, medicine. So, um, so telling the stories give your patients also an anchor. So it makes, it gives them a way to talk about you and what you do. You know, I mean, I used to, you know, I, I would hear people say, you know, they, they tell the story, they'd say, oh gosh, I saw this great doctor and he did, you know, they don't even maybe know his name, but they know what he did, right? Oh, he was like at the National Institute of Health doing research and then got sick and then he just like abandoned that whole career and then went into something else. So like whatever it is, maybe, you know, and maybe it's beyond your, your training as a doctor. I mean, some of my clients talk about when they were seven years old, you know, that a situation that happened or some, you know, some situation that really right then and there, they knew that they wanted to, they wanted to go into medicine or, you know, whatever it might be. And it might not even be medicine related. It might be something else. So to really kind of take a look and see how can you tell your story? How can you talk to your, talk to your patients or, you know, put it on your website, put it in your brochure. So let them know that you're human and that you have, you know, that you, that you have a story behind why you're doing what you're doing and allow them to really connect with you. Um, and it really makes it easy for them to send you other people. Now also connect with your team. You know, your team is, they're like your most important patients. <laughs> and I think sometimes, you know, doctors forget that their team is really 
so important to their success because your team is going to be an extension of you, right? They're really, they're out there, they're talking. So, you know, really connect with your team and, and um, bring them into your life too and, and keep, you know, keep that, keep that fresh. Um, you can do that by making a, you know, practice mission statement. How many people have a mission statement? Do you guys have a, a good mission statement? Yeah, so, I mean, that's really great too if you have your whole office to work on the mission statement um, because it helps them to bond with each other and they really see, you know, the, and they have some kind of ownership. They feel like they're really a part because then they're a part of the, um, of the whole practice, you know, and they've got a little piece in the mission statement, even if it's, I'd rather see that word to be the instead of, you know, and or it, whatever. And then they have that ownership and they feel like they're really a part of. Um, also, you can encourage your team members to create their very own mission statement. Why are they there in your practice? Aside from your practice mission statement, but what is their personal mission statement? You know, like at Starbucks, they do that. And Starbucks does a lot of great employee training. Um, but for them to really say, this is my purpose in being here and my purpose, not, not the doctor's purpose or anything, but my purpose, why am I there? Strategy number four, how do you keep your patients, aside from tying them up and hand spoon feeding them, <laughs> how, do you, how are you gonna keep them coming back? How do you keep them loyal to you? How do you keep them coming around? Um, well, one way is to offer packages and programs. And we did that a lot in our office. Um, you know, we made it so that we would create a whole package for them. They could do a three month program, they could do a six month program, they could do a year program. And it made it so much easier to administer the care to them. It made it easier to keep track of them. Um, and it also, you know, it really, it helped it, it helped the patients too, because they, number one, they knew that you had a plan, right? So when you're presenting the program, you know, you say, okay, we've got a, a three month program and this is what we're gonna do. And this is the outcome, you know, so this is, you know, having, having a benefit, benefit laden outcome. So um, this is what we're gonna do in the course of the three months. And um, this is what's included. And so you can really like let them know that you've got a plan, you've done this before, you've had other clients that have gone through the same program. You know, because a lot of times one of the things that I would hear from other, you know, people that, you know, just complaining about the problem with doctors, I tell them that I was a health consultant, and they'd be like, oh gosh, they need that so bad. You know, so many people just say that to me. They're, they're like, oh, that's a great business, because those doctors, they really need a lot of help. And part, part of it, part of it so I'd be like, yeah, okay. Um, but they would say, like, you know, they don't tell you. So, like, you go to a doctor, you have your first visit, you pay a couple hundred dollars for the first visit, and then they say, okay, come back, and um, then, and then what? Okay, so come back, I come back, and then they're like, okay, well, this is what I found, and da 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 da, and then, okay, now what? Um, well, come back. <laughs> you're like. Okay, so it's sort of like, you know, you don't feel like they really have a plan. They're just practicing on you. They don't really know what's going on. But when you offer them a package, like, okay, so here's your report of findings. They come in for their first visit. Their second visit is their report of findings. That's when you present them their care plan. And you say, this is what we're gonna do. This is what I found. This is what your lab tests show. This is what we should put you on. Here are the supplements that I'd like for you to take and this is how many times I'd like to see you. I think after we'll do a three month program on you and after three months then we can evaluate what's going on with you. And the patient's like, oh great, there's a program, there's a plan, we've got supplements, I got everything. And then, there, then the only uh, thing is the cost and how to figure that one out. So then the patient's very confident. They say, yeah, you know what, I can say yes to that. Instead of like coming back, oh, should I go back? I, you know, I'd rather kind of go out to dinner. Maybe I'd rather go on a vacation than pay that doctor. So it really also encourages patients to get results with you as well because they don't stop their care, they don't stop their supplements because they've already paid for everything. Everything's included. So also you can make sure that they're actually taking their supplements because you know when they're sh they should be running out of their supplements and if they're not running out and, and you know ready to get more, then you know that they're not being necessarily compliant. So it's like, doctor, why am I not getting results? Are you taking your supplements? Oh yeah, well, gosh, you've only gotten like, you know, <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't reordered them. So then you know, you know that they're not, that they're not, um, they're not really being compliant. So it helps the patient and there are also benefits to the practitioner as well. So it helps you to streamline your practice 
so that you, everybody in your office knows if it's the third visit for a thyroid patient, this is what's going to happen. This is exactly what we're doing. This is exactly what's happening. We need to do a blood draw. We need to you know, do, do a reval. So whatever it is, it really makes it easy for everyone to be on the same page. So you can create scripts. You can create standard operating procedures. So it saves your staff time as well because everything is prepaid and pre-scheduled. So your patients aren't going to the front desk to pay every time. They're not rescheduling and figuring that out. You really handle everything when they sign up. So your staff is trained to say, let's just schedule all your appointments right now. If you need to change them later, you can, but let's just get everything scheduled out right now. And then it just makes it so much easier. So your front desk is not always dealing with the person looking at their things. Oh, I can't make it on Tuesday. So um, anyway, so then it makes it also easy to offer the next phase of care. So once they've had the three months, then you can say, okay, we finished this. This is what, what we've completed. These are the results. I'd either like to see you for another three months or you're good. But maybe now there are some other issues that came up when you took the blood test. Maybe now there's something else that needs some kind of, an, of attention and you can talk to them about that. So it just really kind of organizes all of the phases of your care and it really makes it easy for patients to engage with you and it makes it easy for you and your staff to keep up with what's going on with your patients. Um, and also packages increase your collections and it increases patient satisfaction because they get, gr they get great results. So if you can really offer them something that's, that's um, you know, a, a, a package, a program that they're going to be on for three months, because at the time when they're in a lot of pain, they're saying, you know what, I'll do it. Whatever you say, I'll do it for three months, I'll do this, they'll make that commitment. And, you know, because you know what happens when they come in a little bit, they start to feel better, then they start missing their appointments, and then they're just like, well, I'm, I'm good enough, you know. So when you have that little, that, that door opens a crack, you can just really stick a wedge in it by offering them something that's going to help them to, you know, to really, to, to make those lifestyle changes and really change their life and really make a big difference so that they stick with their program and they get the results that they're looking for. Uh, you know, it really allows you to be their partner and to really help them to get to the top and to really achieve their goals and what they want to do. Um, so that was uh, number four, packages and programs. And the last one is to put your marketing on autopilot. Um, so, um, so there's National Fill in the Blank Month. Do you guys know what National Fill in the Blank Month is? <laughs> so, so, silly. So yeah, like January is like weight loss month, or I don't know what January is, but, but I know February is Healthy Heart Month, right? It's Valentine's Day, it's Healthy Heart Month, and then it's like, it's Black History Month, and there's just, like, there's a million things, right, that are like the, the national fill in the blank month. So that's a great way for you to come up with some themes for what you're doing in your office. Um, so it's like you can Google the monthly, weekly, and daily. Believe it or not, there is a daily, there's like national National Bath Day. There's, a, you know, I, I don't know where they come. National Dill Pickle Day. I mean, you can't, just can't even believe how, you know. I mean, I'm looking up all this stuff. I, I have a course, and I, I downloaded the whole thing, and I created a whole thing for it. So it's like nine or ten or maybe sixteen pages long. I don't know what it is, but it has all of the fill in the blank months, days, weeks, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it really, it's really good to give you ideas on what you can do. So if you have a theme for the month, so like say January, you're going to focus on weight loss because that's what everybody wants to do, right? Changing their lifestyle, weight loss. February is Healthy Heart Month, so you can come up with things like for, for Healthy Heart or it's Autism Month, something like that. So you can create a lecture in your office around that, around that particular topic. You can, um, you know, participate in some kind of a, I don't know, some parade or some kind of a, you know, some kind of, what, what do they call those fairs, festivals that they have. You know, so really look at, look at what it is that, you know, is, is uh, available at uh, fill in the blank month. You can sponsor a community event. Um, so you can use this to plan a marketing activity for every single month of the year. And then, so then you have your marketing, like you know what you're going to be doing. And what I recommend is that you do maybe a smaller event, so maybe monthly you do something in your office, maybe it's just a lecture on, you know, on, on some, some kind of health topic that your patients are interested in or that are, that's associated with the fill in the blank month. But then you look at quarterly. So you take a look at the whole year and um, you look at, um, 
oh, I kind of got ahead of myself there. But you look at the whole year, and so you do a yearly marketing calendar. So you have the quarterly activity. So I would recommend that you do one activity a quarter. That's like a bigger activity. Like in my office, we put on some film screenings. Um, I found a film that I really liked, and I would raise money for a nonprofit. So all of the proceeds that we got for the, for the sales, we'd raise money for a nonprofit, but that would allow me to rent out a theater for $400 instead of like 1500 that <laughs> they did, because I'd say I'm doing it for a nonprofit. And then we'd raise money for that. We would invite people to come. People were interested in the, you know, the, the whatever filming it was. We would do some kind of a panel. So I did a film called What Babies Want, which was about natural birth. So I got some celebrities to come. I got some congressmen or congresswoman showed up. Um, so and then you have a panel afterwards, and people that do a panel discussion about it. And it was just a really an awesome <laughs> afternoon because you can get the word out about something that you're interested in, something that you're passionate about. Um, you attract a lot of your ideal clients because they're also interested in the same thing. Um, and it just makes a, a you know really great a great way to you know build your email list. Now you can sell tickets online. You can get emails. Back then when we did it, it wasn't like email wasn't a big thing. But that's also a great way to collect some email lists. So doing community events, whether it's a film screening or something else. Um, but you know this this sheet just kind of helps you do that. But also with the. Um, with the National Fill in the Blank Month, that really helps you with piggyback marketing, which is you take advantage of news, newspapers and news outlets like the, you know, Channel 5, Channel 11, you know, the, the smaller news shows. They're looking for human interest stories. They're looking for things to feature. They're looking for local businesses to feature. So if you're doing something in alignment with, they're always doing stories on, you know, it's National whatever, Healthy Heart Month, and here's a doctor's office that's doing a free screening or something like that or a reduced screening. So it's possible that they can feature your office just because you're doing a story that they're already looking for people to, to kind of join in that. Um, so, you know, just a word on press releases too. You can get some great press by actually writing the press release for them. You know, if you just sort of send out a press release, you're probably not going to get a lot of, of traction. But if you frame the press release as if it's already a story that's written for the you know for the news outlet the newspaper whatever you're much more likely to get that published because they don't have to do anything it's sort of like oh here's a story like it's already a story I can just you know call them up check a few facts maybe you know something like that and then it's much more likely that they'll that they'll publish it um, so let's see I think we got everything and then you know you can schedule your own monthly community events in your office in our office, we used to do um, recipe night. So once a month, or you know, once every quarter, we would do a healthy recipe night. So we would have, we had a book that we were a part of. So they had some recipes in the book. So we had people pick a, pick their favorite recipe from the book, and they would bring it, and we do a potluck. And it was a great way for people to get to know each other in our practice, um, and also you know, pick up some, do some healthy recipes, and um, it was just a great way for them to invite a friend to our office, and then they would get to know the doctor and you know so just a lot of fun activity so a way to build community around your office just allow people to you know really get involved learn something and have a nice night out kind of a social thing um, you can do health talks on hormones thyroid cholesterol whatever your you know your ideal client is interested in um, another thing is to automate your patient communication and education there are a lot of tools now that you can use like constant contact and things that where you can just plug in, you can do automated welcome letters. So when you have a brand new patient, you can you know, maybe write six letters in advance and then have that content drip out to them. So they have the welcome letter, it's great to know you in your practice, so you send them that one, then three days later, automatically, they're gonna get another letter that says, hey, you know, I just, I do this thing, or I have this book, or, you know, there's another way that you can interact with our office, so that you can just give them smaller chunks of information, so you're staying in touch with them, but you don't have to do a thing. You just put them into the, into the funnel, and then they start getting these automated letters, and it's super easy, and you do it once, and then it works for all the new patients that you get. Um, let's see, webinars, create webinars to attract your ideal client, that's another thing, you know, so a lot of this stuff is just leveraging 
the power of the internet. Um, you can use webinars to attract new clients to your office you know, because you can actually specifically target people. You can do Facebook Lives, you can do, you know, you can, you can put all these things and you can really target the people that you want based on geography. Um, use YouTube videos to attract and educate your ideal clients. You can also use YouTube to educate your patients. So if you have a lot of information, especially in functional medicine, um, you know, you have a lot of information that you're giving the patient on the first visit. Sometimes your first visit is an hour and a half or two hours. Um, you can cut that down by creating videos with that information that you want them to have so that they're pre-educated before they come in for the first visit. So there's a lot of information that you're just repeating, that you're saying to the same patients. Um, you know, if you start to pay attention, you probably will realize that there's, you're saying the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, but if you record that, you can put it on YouTube, make a private channel, and have the patient watch it, then you can save a lot of time so that you can you know, see more patients, cut down on the time that you're spending with each, each new patient on their first visit. So I think we've gone through all of our five strategies. Yay.